Okay, it's a pleasure to have it in my heart to introduce Marcia to begin our time. And I know with Marcia, we, we know her heart is, is with the Lord and whatever she brings always is something tremendous and exquisite. So I look forward to time to sharing this time with all of us and with Marcia. Marcia? Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you all. Sound okay? Yes. It was such a pleasure to watch you gathering. Some of you um, I haven't seen or heard voices of for a very long time, and um, I'm just really touched that you felt to join this time. The, um, the sense of stars assembling in the heaven was vivid with me. So I feel us joining our hearts together and I'd like to begin with a prayer. Beloved Lord, the sense of your large heart is so vivid in this moment. To feel the sparkling presence, the steady shining of each one that has gathered. And to feel your love for all of us and particularly at this very special time for our world. While we may be, the, the destruction that we see on our planet may loom large to us, at the same time, we feel and see your presence embracing and stewarding it all. Each day we see so much evidence of your majestic artistry, whether it's in a glorious sunset that fills the sky with gold, or the way the sunlight sparkles on the pine needles, or a tiny little chipmunk. In so many ways, you reveal your continuous presence. And so as we gather for the creative purpose of this hour, we remember we are your body. You are in us, you are surrounding us, and all is well. Oh, man. Mm. Themes from our anniversary service with David and Robert have continued moving in me, probably in you too. The significance of the new cycle opening, the purification and trust to overcome the giants and enter the promised land. It occurred to me recently that Very few on the planet have had as many decades as we have consciously moving in trust. We've been blessed with a wealth of understanding and experience of the trustworthiness 
of the creative process. Yet, in this cycle, <clears throat> we may at times feel fear more vividly than ever. We can see fear intensifying in mankind. I sense we who have trusted the most are being given the opportunity to meet patterns of fear in victory, to open a pathway for others. Last month in Anne's service and in Yoranda's words, we touch the fact that the place we live is in our heart. There's been a lot in recent days to exercise our hearts as turmoil in the world increases, probably impacting us each in different ways. <clears throat> One night feeling this, the attunement current led me directly to a page in volume 17 of the third sac sacred school, The Right Use of Fear by Martin. It addressed so perfectly what we're handling now in our world. I want to read some parts from it. We are indeed responsible with those others who serve with us for guiding the unfoldment which is taking place in the world and for offering a hand of control into the obstreperous human pattern. Isn't that a great description of our job? <laughs> so back to Martin. We know how this is done. It is done in our own momentary living. We find constantly that we have a relatedness to whatever it is that arises in the world. And we see this if we are alert in our own circumstances. So in other words, our circumstances carry the same patterns that are challenging millions of people on the planet. Back to Martin. We are all acquainted with fear. As long as fear is present in the consciousness of mankind, we need to have a connection with it. Fear is attached to many things, different things for different people. One of the fears that is most universal might be described as the fear of loss. Precious things you are afraid of losing particularly. Being honest, you will recognize at least a certain continuing subjection to this sort of fear. An awareness of this fear is necessary to us because it is a fear that is universal in the world. The fear of insecurity, fear that one will somehow be left alone. The things upon which we depend will be taken away from us. Fears will arise, and we are quite content that they should arise, because this enables us in spiritual expression to use such fears to advantage. When the fears arise, we look at them. We understand what they are and where they come from. Seeing them as evidence of an absence, we are in position to provide a presence, our own presence, and the presence of our own spiritual expression. 
Perfect love casts out fear. It casts it out of the position of control. It does not eliminate it immediately. In another place, he says, spiritual expression eliminates subjection to fear. It doesn't eliminate fear immediately. I want to interject here that I think it really helps to realize this so that we don't judge ourselves. So in time, spiritual expression displaces the fear. It fills the void with our presence. Martin actually gives a poignant example of doing this in his own experience. He described um, the fear of impending disaster and the consistency that it required to deal with it. The example was the necessity of commuting between the 100 and Sunrise Ranch. I'm glad to see there are those at 100 Mile House right now. <laughs> so back to Martin's words. For years and years, we drove back and forth, back and forth, year after year, several times a year. At times, it looked as though this was going to be our lot forever. As long as it was necessary, I did it. You may find yourself in a situation which requires diligent application in something that you would not have particularly chosen to do. I don't know that I would have particularly chosen constantly to be driving back and forth between Sunrise Ranch and the hundred, hundred, with sometimes a sense of impending disaster on the journey, never knowing quite what I was going to find when I arrived at the destination. But whatever is necessary, do it. Don't consult your feelings in the matter. Do it. That is spiritual expression. Very straightforward. This had to be done, so I did it. The way we feel is quite a secondary thing, insofar as spiritual expression is concerned. As I say, there may be an upwelling of fear and a good emissary may say, I shouldn't be afraid. Well, why be afraid then? In other words, why accept that which is felt as the controlling element in one's experience? Concern yourself with spiritual expression. In other words, with the right handling of that upwelling. Ah. Here is something coming to me to be dealt with. It is said that a person is not brave simply because he has no fear. He is brave because he has fear and deals with it. We are honest enough and wise enough to acknowledge the fact of fear without being subject to it. It has been said many times that this is a vibrational ministry, a ministry of spiritual expression, where there is invisible work done, invisible mending in a way. We are concerned to become experts in this field so we can handle whatever it is that arises. When I found this, it brought me a greater sense of ease. I hope it did you also. Martin speaks quite directly about the fear of loss, of things precious to us. Much of the news these days 
carries huge waves of fear that all is lost. Probably all of us have had times when it looked like all was lost. But later, we saw that the Lord was bringing a great blessing through the cycle. Something important and maybe something that had seemed impossible before. Because we trusted and stayed centered, we were part of the essential channel for the blessing to emerge. That, I believe, is one of the vital things we're called to offer mankind as it goes through cycles where it looks like all is lost. The trust and faith of many will falter at such times. I've heard interviews on the news, maybe you have too, of people who have lost their homes in a massive flood or earthquake. And sometimes they say, I've lost my faith in God. I have great respect for people who are experiencing devastating loss. It is a huge challenge. And it's inspiring when it brings out their strength and service. But many fall into despair and make things worse. Their reactions in fear stir destructive acts that interfere with what the Lord can bring. There must be those who provide a channel for the integration that the Lord can bring through the disintegration, the birth of the promised land as the old passes away. Our circumstances put us in touch with challenges that many people around the world are experiencing. What comes to us is usually not as dramatic or graphic, but it carries the same feeling currents and thoughts. These are contact points for us to open pathways into the new state for humanity. As Martin said, we need to become experts in this field of invisible work. <clears throat> in October, Eugen offered a service in Korea that opened another angle on the creative handling of fear. He said, Fear brings with it an identity that we often unconsciously accept. Its message is something like, I'm afraid, I can't do this, I will fail. He described seven steps to handle fear creatively. And he suggested that we slow the process down so that the fear identity that we unconsciously accept can be met in true consciousness. I began experimenting with this when, my, when I couldn't open my Microsoft account, I saw a subtle I, I failed identity. Now that is a very lightweight example. But I started noticing that whenever I felt resistance, there was a fear identity underneath it. And I realized those fear identities are locked in the three-dimensional world. They may masquerade as something really valuable, 
even aspects of the true servant of the Lord, like the hardworking one or the busy one. But they are identities locked in time, space, and achievement. Often in lack, too. So when I feel fear, slowing down gives me the space to become aware of the identity that is emanating the fear. A common one for me is the efficient one. I call her Ms. Efficiency. And now that I've become more aware, I hear her input and sometimes I follow it but she doesn't get to decide anymore. So while we meet fear with spiritual expression, we can also deliberately let go of identities that trap us in the three-dimensional world. These identities want to do things the way they've always done them. But as things become more complex and uncertain, our old approaches often don't work anymore. Fear is connected to three-dimensional identities and three-dimensional habits. When I realized that, it stirred a lot more realizations. I was pondering all this a few weeks ago while I was swimming laps. A more vivid sense came of the new level this cycle is opening. That there's new experience to be known, both individually and collectively. I kept noticing that this new way of handling fear was expanding my sense of the seven dimensional world. I had experienced that before in cycles of great challenge. I felt a connection in this with what our master did in handling the crucifixion cycle. In that greatest of all challenges, he he moved through and opened all seven dimensions for mankind. I began to sense that there's something of that that we can do in the smaller challenges that we face, and that this is a significant part of our work. Later, this led me to one of my favorite services, From Fall to Restoration, where Martin invites us to expand our consciousness to live in the seven-dimensional world. I want to read some parts from that also, and it gives a higher perspective on what's happening in our world now. So I've excerpted it and I will interject when I need to. Um, Martin was describing the reasons why the fall could occur because the earth was moving through a vibrational cloud in the cosmos. And he says, in different words, man was warned about this. Now, quote Martin, that in the outworking cycles, a time would come when his mental comprehension of what was occurring would be obscured. His vision would be clouded because of the vibratory factors that were being brought to bear out of the cosmos. He was warned so that he wouldn't assume that he could see when he couldn't. All that was necessary 
was for him to remain properly centered without judging and without imagining that he had vision when he didn't. But the solar system now has continued on in the circuit and is emerging out of that original vibrational influence which made it possible for the fall to take place. As there is an emergence out of this, the fallen state cannot continue to exist and is in the process of passing away. The furnace, we might say, is being heated seven times hotter than it was wont to be heated. In this intensification, the self-active mind cannot continue to exist. Its reaction tends to produce a state of insanity. And we see this everywhere. People imagining that they are sane, but behaving insanely. So we have a deplorable condition, but it is a process of cleaning up too. There is an emergence out of the vibrational cloud and into the light again, so that the restoration must take place, simply because the fallen state can no longer exist. We are rapidly moving to this point. There is an intensification. If we do not associate ourselves with the new state, we experience destruction. In this fallen state, we have been living in a three-dimensional world. Actually, for most, it has been less than three dimensions. When the fact of the matter is that it is a seven-dimensional world. Unless we are capable of surviving in a seven-dimensional world, we cannot survive. It is no longer possible to continue to exist merely in a three-dimensional world. We must come out into a seven-dimensional world, and we are in the process of coming out with a bang. There is an exponential curve in this regard. This impetus, which is being experienced by everyone, a very intense compulsion increasing, is a destructive thing to those who are attempting to continue to exist in a three-dimensional world. We see this attempt being made valiantly all around us. The endeavor is to keep things going in the world as it has been known. Now, I want to link what Martin is saying here with something that many of you online probably heard Bill Isaac say earlier this month. He said, Approaches, this is Bill Isaac, approaches that used to work at all kinds of levels, in institutions, in governments, in religious contexts, and personally, no longer do. So Martin goes on to describe that most of man's approaches are based in precedents out of the past. And he says, quote, <clears throat> That was possible for a while, while we lived in the cloud and were able to exist in this three-dimensional state. But there are no precedents, within the memory of man at least, with respect to a seven-dimensional state. So he is entirely at sea. However, there is this more or less desperate endeavor to maintain the three-dimensional world with which man is familiar. Actually, in the long run, an impossible task, because we are moving out of an old state into a new one, whether we like it or not. We are being born out of it on a space vehicle. He's referring to our planet. <laughs> so the new is coming, a state in which the self-activity of the human mind is impossible. 
Therefore, if one insists upon maintaining a self-active mind, there is a crunch coming. There is a stone wall beyond which the self-active mind cannot pass. So it behooves us, surely, to permit the self-activity of the mind to pass away so that we have a different state of consciousness, which is capable of continuing to exist in the new vibrational condition. This intensification, this hotting up, this increasing impetus is driving some crazy and allowing for an expansion of consciousness and understanding on the part of others. And then I want to summarize what he says in longer words, which of those it is, crazy or expanded consciousness, depends on a person's actual experience, not their beliefs. Interesting point. So back to Martin. The requirement is absolute honesty because there is no means of remaining dishonest and experiencing the new state. We are emerging out of that three-dimensional condition into a seven-dimensional condition. And the intensification of things, the building up of the pressure, the igniting of the explosive is what actually propels the movement into the new state. So all this intensifying pressure and turmoil is actually propelling us into the new state. Isn't that a creative perspective? But to experience the new state, the seven dimensional world, we have to let the self-activity of the mind pass away. As Martin said, the self-active mind cannot continue to exist. Its reaction tends to produce a state of insanity. I think that is so much more obvious now than it was in 1970 when he spoke this. Self-activity is a really good description of the mind determining the way versus yielding to heaven's impulse. In the beginning, I mentioned that very few on the planet have had as many decades as we have consciously moving in trust. That's true also with letting the self-active mind pass away. We'd probably be considered experts in this by most people if they understood enough to recognize it. But this culminating cycle is calling for new levels of experience. In the anniversary service, David spoke about the increasing purification as we approach the fourth day. I'm finding that new ways of handling fear and letting go of three-dimensional identities and habits is part of this purification. I've enjoyed Andrew Shire's words on a couple of occasions when he's spoken about the compulsion he's felt to change the way he does things. He gave a simple example of the way he shaves, but I assume he meant more than that. <laughs> and he said that it can be uncomfortable at times. That's similar to my experience. We mastered these things years ago at one level, but there are new levels opening and they are calling us higher. It takes courage, daring to move through the discomfort. 
But that's how we overcome the giants of this era. Every challenge that comes is an opportunity to overcome our giants and enter the promised land. The experience of living in the seven dimensional world. As we do that, we are bringing within the seven dimensional world within range of mankind's consciousness. We are opening paths for others who are drawn to it by their own inner compulsions. So the increasing fear on our planet is increasing the pressure to move into the seven dimensional world. It's bringing pressure for the mind to yield to spirit at new levels. One aspect of that that I've noticed, both in my own experience and I think in the world, is the mind's habit to want to see the whole path before it will trust it. So it goes something like this. Show me how all this will work. And if I think it's possible, then I will trust it. But that's a trap. It is exactly what we have to let go of, the mind in the driver's seat. There really is important work for the mind to do to help, to perceive, but not to direct. What the mind can see is the next step, not the whole path. If we take that step in trust, then the next step is shown. So we move step by step. Martin indicated that we're coming to a point where no approach will work until the mind yields to spirit. We have many events in the world these days that are stirring fear. Wars, earthquakes, climate change that's bringing massive flooding, extreme drought, and mass migration. Because the mind solutions to these are not really working, that produces more fear. But all this can actually help us make the changes to live in the seven dimensional world. I think a significant part of our work is to pioneer this in our own ex in our own circumstances so that we open the way for others. For example, we're no longer relying only on the three-dimensional world for solutions. We sense and draw upon invisible higher dimensions for guidance. In Anne's service last month, she spoke about unseen hands in the invisible planes that are playing their part in this special time on the planet. I think many of us sense that the veil is thinning and that promptings from this range are becoming more noticeable. But, if we're wedded to old ways of seeing and doing things, there's no space to sense those promptings. I'm finding that it takes a willingness to explore and flexibility to live in the seven dimensional world. And as we do that, we develop new habits and new ranges of pneumoplasm that deepen our experience of it. Our practice of this in our momentary living, I think, is preparing us for times when it will be even more vital 
that our minds yield to spirit. I often think about Moses at the Red Sea. He developed this yielding, this deep attunement that allowed him to sense heaven's way when the appearance was there was no way through that Red Sea. I'm already experiencing times when it looks like there's no way through. I rather suspect you are too. <laughs> and I think there are going to be a lot more of those. So it's good practice for us. Fortunately, entering the promised land in this era does not require that much physically. It doesn't require that much physical stamina. I think that's good to know at our age. In essence, what it requires is bringing the spirit of victory into each circumstance. It is the spirit in which we meet whatever comes that is the victory, not the appearance. And when that is our approach, the Lord shows the way through. There are many aspects to embody of living in the seven dimensional world. Today, I've focused on some, particularly that we can do in our individual living. But I am passionate about what we can do collectively. When we gather together in true purpose, it expands our experience of the seven dimensional world. I wanna share an example of that. A small group of us have been meeting by Zoom about once a month. And recently, one of the groups spontaneously invited us to meet, to speak the word together in the midst of the fire and chaos in the world. I knew some of the challenges that each one was facing. And I was so heartened to hear how they're bringing victory into these. It was very clear that anyone's victory is a victory for everyone. One in the group described what we shared together this way. We spoke the word together amidst the mounting destruction in our world and experienced it opening a path for victory, not only in us, but through us, for all with willing hearts in the world. Yes. Amidst the mounting destruction, it's important that we never lose sight of what heaven is birthing through it, because we are vital channels for this birth, the birth of the consciousness and experience of living in the seven-dimensional world. Some of what I've shared may seem a little bit complex, so I want to close with a very simple mantra I made to help me open new pathways in my daily life. I love you, Lord. I trust and follow your impulse and rest in that. So I look forward to hearing from you and expanding on whatever this has stirred in you. Marcia, I so deeply appreciate your words and your consideration this morning about fear. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that we all um, have probably had working in our, ourselves as, as we address that individually. 
I want to very briefly recount a situation that happened exactly two weeks ago today. Mm -hmm. My husband had been in the, had had emergency surgery and he was in the ICU mm -hmm. and we were visiting and he said, I need to lie down for a moment. And the next thing I knew he had fallen over with his mouth open, his eyes wide open and stopped mm -hmm. breathing. Mm -hmm. And there was an instant sense of fear, obviously, but I ran to the door. I was in the ICU at least and called for help. And a flood of doctors and nurses came in and I retreated to the back corner and knew the presence of many angels in that room too. Mm -hmm. Knew the presence of the Lord there. Knew that it was not his time to go, even though the doctors were saying the pulse is low, the pulse is low, but he... The, and, it, you know, there was a lot of intensity. The whole thing happened in about a minute. <laughs> and he came through, obviously, fine. But I'll tell you, the experience of that fear and what you mentioned earlier, the fear of loss, was there in my human sense, but it was diminished by the angelic presence that encompassed this room. I, in fact, I think it encompassed the entire hospital. <laughs> And it was a, it was very life changing. I think any of us that have had a dramatic moment of any kind like that know what is the truth in that moment. And I just give thanks that we have these opportunities to practice. And, you know, I personally am thrilled to see Jeffrey Goldstein on this call because I can't even imagine some of the things that you've seen, Jeffrey. <laughs> but again, it's our opportunity to rise up, as you were saying so beautifully, Marcia, to rise up in ourselves, to let this fear just evaporate because we are present and we know what's happening. And in that situation with my husband, I knew he wasn't going to pass away. I knew it was not his time. I knew that he would come through that crisis in that one minute, <laughs> which felt like a couple of hours, and that all was well. And I think we all feel that. We have these, the fears come up in small ways. Like you were saying, your Microsoft experience had seemed small compared to this. And yet, it's still an opportunity to address the fear, to address whatever that is and let it go. And so I give great thanks for this consideration this morning because there is much for us to do. And I think that we are still just at the beginning of what there is so much for us to do. So thank you, Marcia. It's always a joy to be with you and to share your lovely, beautiful spirit. I concur. Oh, I've seen the seven dimensional world. It took me to have to go to the intensive care unit and uh, have brain biopsy and near ascension experience and all that. I don't advise it, but if it happens, have the glimpses of heaven, the seven dimensional world. And I found that to be there, my experience was to be at what we've called the crossover point, the point with position, but no magnitude. Why no magnitude? Because the magnitude is the position. So be steady, hold the position, fear not, and radiate from that point. And I find heaven and earth are one. Then how the power can move through this little pinprick. We see that with our naked eye. We look at the midnight sky and we see this dark canvas with these little pinpricks until we see telescopes looking at this kaleidoscope out there in the universe. Well, where's the universe closer than hands and feet? It is in this crossover point that I, you, and everyone can hold, hold it steady. That's the present moment. No foreboding for the future, no regretted past. The present moment is there when we can radiate. 
So when you watch the news and we have reactions to bad news, I radiate to that. When I have an opportunity to talk to the delivery man, I radiate. When I eat my dinner, I radiate, particularly in Thanksgiving. I was careful to eat one bite of everything that was in this kaleidoscope uh, table. I digress. What we do in every moment is powerful. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I'm still here. You're still here. Why? We have a place to be here. We were projected into this three-dimensional world to let it ascend. Let it ascend. Let it be faster. Uh, uh, if you have a problem, it's uh, behind, we behind the curve. See, self-preoccupied. I be in the moment and I feel you there in the moment. Life is full then, so we'll do what we do with, until we come home. Otherwise, we're here projected in this, this third dimensional world. Let it be the fourth, let it be fifth, whatever makes consciousness ascend in place here. What else have we got? I don't have anything else at the moment. My schedule is clear. Here's this too. I'll meet you there. Hold the position, Pendel, beautifully put. I was thinking of something, Marcia, that you brought forward and that brought to mind we are in a process of birth. And in that process, there's fear. I don't think there's any woman who's ever gone through birth process that didn't have a little aspect of fear that came up, but that is met with the beauty of the birth itself. I don't think we can move through any process that is that deeply meaningful and radiating without a little bit of fear of the unknown, which is all it is, because we don't know. Well, okay, good. We're not really supposed to know, or we would know. It's as simple as that. But in that process of birth, there is a work that needs to be done. And it is work. <laughs> That's why they call the birth process labor. <laughs> we do, we labor in the moment to release, to radiate, to give forth the newborn, to give forth the open space that makes it possible to move to move into this each step process step by step and isn't it absolutely absolutely magnificent and wonderful thank you oh judith thank you so much for your words i I so appreciate how you brought in this um, element of birth, which is so central to what we're experiencing as the third dimensional paradigm of being in polarity with sphere um, is giving way to the emergence of, of what's coming. And indeed fear is, always at this level anyway part of the dance that we are doing with love and it is in polarity with love at this level that is the polarity so it's never not present but what it gives us an opportunity to do is to experience the exquisite of the dance 
with the divine. Um, on either side of the coin of exquisite is is pain or or ex ecstasy, and always there is this choice given to us at this level to choose fear or love, and fear is only the absence of love. There really is nothing there. Yet at this level of our incarnation, we are given the opportunity to dance with that. Uh, and that dance in each moment is exquisite. So thank you for this time. Thank you, Leo. And thank you, everyone who's spoken. And Marsha, for your words of, of deep wisdom and uh, tonal beauty. I... I I felt like you were speaking in many tongues. Uh, there was the line of thought, uh, and then there were the overtones, which um, I, I felt like I heard voices, uh, one of which was, don't be afraid. And I could hear another voice asking, well, then, then who do I be? And the answer was, be me. Be me, the one, the angelic one who, as Leo beautifully put, participates competently in the dance of allowing, and as you pointed out, Marcia, sometimes over a period of time, that allows that which comes in the feeling realm, fear or whatever, to be transformed. And as we relinquish the idea of the one who bees afraid <laughs> to the one who is, then the power of seven dimensional living is accessed. And that which needs to come out of the fog of these 20,000 tragic years can do so with as little fanfare as possible into a place, into the place of wholesome living, of beauty, of majesty, and of grace. Thank you so much for focusing this time. Marsha. I want to express my deep gratitude. It's a cornucopia <laughs> that you have presented us with of beautiful elements of the truth. It sounds like a tall order. But the only thing that's tall about it is seven dimensions instead of three. I loved the way, and I've never heard it put like that before, how entering the promised land, the promised land is in fact coming into the seven dimensional expression or living of our being. That is the promised land. It's not a place we go to. It's a state of being. I think you have laid out a remarkable menu of possibilities for us. I am extremely grateful to David and Anne who run these Temple of Light sessions and produce the transcripts that allow us to view it and review it until we can share the insights and work with you together as a collective on the same elements that have come into your understanding. I'd like to finish by saying how much I 
appreciated your devotional prayer at the beginning and mostly your mantra at the end. And in that, I share it with you. Thank you. Which I appreciate that, the simplicity of how you end it. And I, I love your emphasis on seeing fear as a push rather than dragging us down. And that spiritual expression fills that in. But you think about self-activity versus integrated activity. And that really we're pushed to find our integrated activity together. That's spiritual expression. And that's what allows that pull, that drag of shame of having fear to be shifted, to play our part. When we're self-active, we're in a, you know, we're in a disconnected state and that brings fear and shame. But how we handle the feeling of fear that we, we have, that we feel, is allowing that to push us to greater integrated activity together. Marsha, Laura speaking. I thank you very much for your most beautiful offering and to everyone else who has answered that offering. There is an element of the living being, the living word coming forth in these moments. It is only within the living word that fear finds its proper place. And the human mind will never figure that out. It is only when we gather together and we are actually together in living word together that fear has its proper place and is not a problem. I so appreciate the true living everyone has done. It is that which carries the word of God. And that is what soothes the earth and raises us to other dimensions where there is no fear. Thank you for this movement, Marcia and everyone. We move together or we don't move. And here we are together. There is only one place large enough to hold all of us. That's in the living world. Thank you. I would like to add something here. There is a physiological reason for the experience of fear. Uh, it's a misinterpretation on our part most of the time because we misinterpret the spirit of the single eye coming into the adrenal glands and saying, get to work, do something. And I think this is the power. We, we receive power through these wonderful hormones. <laughs> the spirit of the single eye and the mind misinterprets it as being well. There's power here. I'm, I'm not sure I can handle it. Well, yes, as long as we have a single eye, then, and that single eye is focused in the one. One of, one of the greatest fears I used to have is that I would lose my connection with the one within. You know, that never has happened. All I have to do is choose to, to be connected, to remember, remember, to remember and keep remembering and sooner or later it becomes just natural. And anyway, that's all I have to offer. Thank you. It's very beautiful, Marsha. Hey, Marsha. It's thrilling to see the Lord at work in one's own personal life and circumstance and very reassuring. I'm finding delight in seeing people I don't know or, and people I do know 
coming into the light, into the light, that phrase has popped up a number of times in the last week for me. And it is, it is evidence of the power working through us. And that point you made, Marcia, about as we do this, it provides an avenue for the greater population to ascend in consciousness. And it's thrilling to see that happening uh, with, with great alacrity in these days. Um, reverberations of phrases that are so familiar to us um, there in alternative media mostly. I've given up watching television at all except to kind of maybe see what twist they're putting on it because it can't last and it doesn't last and companies are going bankrupt. Um, people are resigning from positions. It's just um, more and more evidence of the outworking. Things, all things will come into the light of the truth of love before it's all over. And every man, woman, and child will have the opportunity to choose. The soap's going up or down, and we know it's going up because we have that experience and we see it in others. Thank you so much for this consideration. You know, the other thought that comes to mind frequently for me is that training works. We've had years and years of training. And yes, we can fine tune that and, and there's always more in the expansion, but training works and it's good, good to know that we can trust it. So I would like to give great thanks to our Lord of Truth. I think we may. Huh? Go ahead, Mary. I thought we lost. No, I was just pausing. Sorry. I would like to give thanks to our great Lord of Truth, and Marcia, you and others have expressed the greatness and the wisdom of our Lord of Truth. And what a joy it must be in heaven for us to be here now as we are and speaking our living word. Many of you have spoken for me in what I was thinking of. One aspect I'd briefly mention to build on what you said, Marcia. I am having and have been having for quite a while the experience of being involved in situations where I'm a key player And I am encountering other people's fear and their actions and thoughts in a way directly affect me. So that is a very creative experience I have been having, not only within me, as we have been saying, to transform or see those feelings of fear and other emotions in their proper perspective and place. And then also recognizing what's coming up in other people who are so close to me. And the biggest, deepest answer that comes is what someone has always mentioned, also mentioned, which is true of 
any situation, I think, which is patience and wisdom and to wait essentially upon the Lord to reveal the next step. So this is really a beautiful hour. And I, again, give great thanks to each one. I recognize you and honor you as an aspect of truth. And I give great thanks to our Lord of truth and our Lord of love. Are there one or two more that yet wish to speak? And then I'll close. Marsha, I did have a few things I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. What you were saying about how the mind tends to want to leap ahead and have it all figured out beforehand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking that we cannot even imagine a seven-dimensional world. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of that phrase the master spoke, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that I have prepared for you. Mm -hmm. so we can just rest in the fact that we are going from glory to glory. And knowing the absoluteness out of that displaces all fear. Mm. So I have so appreciated mm. the opportunity to share this hour with everyone and to extend our radiant blessing into the world. Thank you, Marsha. Mm. Okay, I will. Oh. Marsha, I would add my my thanksgiving too for for this uh, vibration vibration of peace that has been extended out by reason of of this agreement. And I would thank you for your emphasis on the spirit of victory. Mm. That that's what stood out to me was dealing with these situations on the earth, but knowing what we've inherited mm. through the ages, the cycles mm. of great ones that mm. is a gift to us today. Mm. And, and that is that the victory has been established by the master. Mm -hmm. Others failed around, and he needed to ascend, and the victory continued in various ones, and we have this great gift today to live in the spirit of victory. Mm -hmm. Oh, how good to have this time of agreement to let that echo through our vibration into the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just want to check, was there, David, you had started to speak. Did you want to say something? Well, Yes, <laughs> just to express my appreciation for this period of prayer, Marsha. Particularly for the 45 minutes or so of your speaking. A prayerful time with you in a secret, sacred place apart mm -hmm. from the noise and the affairs of the world. There are times 
in my life where I feel like I'm standing in front of a firing squad. <laughs> uh, assembled by the accuser. Knowing that I, in those few moments, have an opportunity to release something. Mm. And I have imagined the actuality of that happening for various men and women down through history who have stood for something real and true and knew that they were facing their last moments. Mm. But metaphorically in my life, when those feeling things arise, I know that the only thing that opens the way is the expression, I love you, Lord. Mm. And everything changes <laughs> immediately. <clears throat> it doesn't take any time, really. Mm. It's immediate. There may be an unfolding of understanding and meaning that occurs after immediately opening from uncertainty, fear, mm -hmm. accusation. In that moment, I love you, Lord. So it's moving from fear to love immediately. Mm -hmm. And it transforms everything. And it brings light into my mind as well. My mind isn't figuring out anything, but the spirit moving by reason of opening up, I love you, Lord, allows the transmission from on high to come through the heart, my heart. And my mind becomes illuminated with greater understanding that wasn't there just a few seconds before. And it continues to flow out as I hold true to the spirit of I love you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And this is what you brought and what we shared together this morning, this prayerful interplay where we meet the forces of the adversary that are present in the world with I love you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And allow the divine understanding to flow into the heart, transform the heart, flow into the mind, transform the mind, mm -hmm. and move the body wherever it needs to go and do whatever it needs to do. Mm -hmm. Such a rich and precious time, Marsha. Thank you for your leading us in this way this morning. Well, Thank you all, fellow companions, in bringing the experience of the seven dimensional world into our consciousness. You know, I was, I've been living this for at least two months, and um, um, while it may seem a bit complex, actually, you know, the squirrels, the birds, the rabbits, the moose, they're all living in the seven dimensional world. <laughs> it's just the self activity of the human mind that has to um, pass away so that we may also live in the seven dimensional world. And um, I was glad for. Um, Somebody spoke about more people um, coming into the light. Um, I felt that um, many times as I see what people are going through, how can I help? Well, what we can do in our own experience of allowing ourselves to release attachment to that which traps us in only three dimensions is one way we can help. Of course, there are many aspects 
of things we can do. But I think there are very few on the planet who are trained enough to recognize that we have a vital role to play in the birth of the experience and consciousness of living in the seven dimensional world. It may sound like a tall order, but in a way, I think it's Martin invited it 53 years ago. <laughs> so I think it's a matter of letting go of that which is in the way of it. And I am so delighted in what we can do together in that as well. So over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Beautiful. There's lots we can continue to feel in our hearts and open our minds to. And if I may read something that goes along, Marcia, that really struck me this past week. This is from Yoranda. The control of all manifestations on earth will be centered in the God beings who will fully establish the perfect state, the Garden of Eden. For all who will respond to the chaos, for all, with, okay, for all who will respond to the chaos, enough to allow them to survive this period of world transition. Sorry for the stuttering there, but it's in our hands to allow for those who are looking to respond and have a have a place of safety, the opening of those pathways, as you were saying, Marcia, to allow for the, a sense of safety and transition to be experienced. And maybe this garbled as I, as I said that, I think you caught the spirit of that. And let's continue along and opening up these pathways. Our next service will be on December 24th, Christmas Eve, and Robert Murrayman has stepped into the that open spot. <laughs> 